You know what changed forever in the spring of 1981? Carlton Fisk baseball carts, that's what. Yeah, I know. It's small potatoes compared to the beginning of the Reagan administration and the breakdown of labor talks that would lead to the baseball strike and the dreaded split season. But the Fisk thing was big, especially in New England and Chicago and in our wax packs. See, through 1980, Fisk had been a standout catcher for the Boston Red Sox, but he also was among a group of outspoken Sox players who thought they should be paid more. Story goes, that made him sort of a non-favorite of Boston general manager Haywood Sullivan. So when it came time to mail out contracts in the winter of 1980-81, Sullivan duly dropped Fisk's in the slot, but a day past the deadline. Same thing with Fred Lynn if you're keeping score. Finger pointing and name calling ensued and Fisk was granted free agency in February. He signed with the Chicago White Sox in March, and so all those already printed 1981 baseball cards showing Fisk with the Bo Sox were obsolete by opening day. But 1981 was also the year that the card floodgates opened, thanks to Fleer taking down the Topps Monopoly in court in 1980. With special issues and updates appearing throughout the year, collectors got to see cardboard Chai Sox versions of Pudge after all. Here's how it all played out with a rundown of all the Carlton Fisk baseball cards from 1981 in both clam chowder and deep dish pizza flavors. 1981 All-Star Game Program Inserts Carlton Fisk All-Star Game programs in the 1980s included fold-out poster type inserts with pictures of all the All-Star candidates from each league. Oftentimes, collectors would cut out their favorite players and have themselves a nifty new baseball card or 30. Fisk wasn't just an all-star candidate in 1981. He was the American League starting catcher. And you have to figure his personal fan base had grown a heap over the winter. Adding Chicago to your Major League Baseball resume will do that for you if you're any good. As for the Fisk card here, the pick shows the backstop and a violent swing follow through, maybe even lunging forward. Clad in white, socks white, with dark blue accents from head to toe, Pudge looks like he could have stepped out of the 1880s. 1981 Donruss, Carlton Fisk, number 335. Seeing how 1981 was the first year they made baseball cards, Donruss had but just one chance to show collectors their vision of Carlton Fisk in his Red Sox uniform. That vision brought us a smiling Fisk in his Red Sox road grays posed against a gloomy, misty sky. And, well, not sure what else. Is that a tank gun jetting out into the photo behind Fisk? Maybe a subtle warning to would-be base dealers not to run on him. Not the greatest card ever, but a piece of hobby history nonetheless. 1981 Drake's Carlton Fisk, number 32. When Flair broke the seal on Topps Monopoly heading into 1981, they opened up the fire hose that collectors had been sipping from for years, unaware of what may someday come their way. Suddenly, baseball cards were everywhere, relatively speaking. One of those wares was packages of Drake's baked goods, where the hobby was introduced to Drake's big hitters. Produced by Tops and released in only certain regions, e.g. the Northeast, these babies had full-blown Tops backs and gaudy fronts with thick, colorful design that left room for only a fairly small player photo. Still, these 33 guys were sluggers, for the most part, plus uh, John Castino and um, uh, Lee Mazzelli, but mostly superstars like Fisk, appearing in his sparkly new Chicago White Sox uniform. It's a great oddball card of a great catcher, and a set that old collectors still speak of with reverence, as in, when I was 10, I spent the summer in a sugar coma trying to complete the Drake's Big Hitter set. I still need to find Jerry Mumphrey. 1981 Fleer Carlton Fisk, number 224. Like Donruss, Fleer got one shot at Fisk in his Bo Sox uniform. And like Donruss, Fleer went with a smiling Carlton against a gray background. In fact, now that I look at the two cards, I think there is a non-zero chance that the two photos were taken at the same setting at nearly the same time. I mean, sure, Fisk appears to be sporting more luscious locks on the Fleer card, and there's no gun, but... Could all be explained with camera angles and viewer perception. He for sure is wearing a similar getup in the two cards, and it for sure is a dreary day on both. And then there's the donut glazed skin. Could be the same. Either way, I prefer the Fleer design, and besides, the Donruss card is so flimsy, it's always just a sigh away from blowing into the ether, 
and lost forever. 1981 Fleer Star Stickers, Carlton Fisk, number 58. And another besides, Fleer actually created themselves another opportunity to show Fisk with the Red Sox thanks to their star stickers issued in that first year. Star stickers were indeed stickers, but they were big, full card size in fact, and they were backed by a full card back, complete with stats. Not your typical sticker fare like the Topps deal that came in little paper packages and usually ended up on your notebook or the side of the TV next to the wall so your dad couldn't see. So the 1981 Fleer Star Stickers were pretty cool, and they gave us another Fisk Red Sox card. But if you look at this thing closely and then at his base 1981 Fleer card, then flip back and forth and back and forth a few times, yeah, this is definitely that same moment in time, and it may actually be the same photo, just cropped and rotated a bit. It does have blue and gold borders with stars, though. 1981 MSA Peter Pan Sunbeam Discs, Carlson Fisk In the late 1970s and early 1980s, MSA discs were everywhere. Wiffle ball boxes, Pepsi cartons, pizza boxes, floppy disc sleeves, beer coasters, TV guide inserts, rolled up toilet paper rolls, iron-ons, starter logs, and inside of pickle jars. Uh, and only some of that is untrue or exaggerated. In 1981, Carlton Fisk showed up on two separate forms of the disc. One is just Fisk on a blank back disc, and the other is a disc that's part of the Peter Pan Sunbeam set, which also had an available poster where you could hook on the discs with paste maybe, or glue, or tape, or staples, or dog spit. Whatever, it's a team logo-less disc that nonetheless lists Fisk as a member of the White Sox. 1981 Opeechee Carlton Fisk, number 116. The 1981 Opeechee set was not an exact parallel of its tops counterparts, as was sometimes the case with the Canadian issue. Instead, Opeechee was trimmed to 374 cards as compared to tops 726, and of course featured both English and French copies on the card backs. That bilinguality showed up on card fronts too with position designations and all star banners. Since Fisk was an all-star, that made his card front pretty busy, especially when you add in that little extra Opeechee flair, an on-card front footnote that read, now with White Sox. Not to mention the White Sox green border and White Sox cap down the bottom in the corner there. Yep, Opeechee gave us the best of both worlds, Fisk in Red Sox and White Sox, all on one card, and the modest price of a little clutter. 1981 Permographics All-Star Credit Card, Carlton Fisk in 1981, Topps teamed up with a Maryland graphics firm to issue the first of a series of credit cards, thick plastic baseball cards that were shaped like, yes, real credit cards, but without the potential for accruing huge debt. After an initial run of 32 superstar cards, the dynamic duo was back with an 18-card issue featuring the starting lineups from the 1981 All-Star Game. That's where Fisk came into play, and it gave collectors a good look at his new hobby. Blocky Socks Batting Helmet Permographics continued to make the cards through 1983, and they remain curiosities at card shows throughout the 1980s and into the early 1990s. Here we have Fisk in a warm-up jacket, watching intently as something unfolds in front of him. He may be jawing at someone, may just be thinking about jawing at someone. His Red Sox batting helmet, for one of the last times, gleams like a jewel reflecting the perfect blue sky. This is the uncluttered version of the Opeechee card, and it's a masterpiece. Here we have Fisk in a warm-up jacket, watching intently as something unfolds in front of him. He may be jawing at someone, or maybe just thinking about jawing at someone. His Red Sox batting helmet for one of la the last times. 1981 Topps Star Stickers, Carlton Fisk, number 46. This is the standard tiny top sticker fare of the era, with each piece meant to be peeled off its paper back and affixed to an assigned spot within the top sticker album for the year. On this one, Fisk is holding a bat getting ready to go to work in the batter's box and looking back over his shoulder, sort of like he's walking away, saying goodbye. As things turned out, that's exactly what he was doing. 1981 top super home run team, Carlton Fisk. The top Super Home Run Team set was an oversized 4 and 7 8 by 6 and 7 8 inches issue that featured big, beautiful color photos surrounded by white borders and a facsimile autograph. 
It's a pure look that harkens back to the 1976 SSPC set, and yet you never really heard collectors clamoring for these. Maybe it was their obscurity or their limited availability and coverage. Each card was part of a team set that came with its own package, amounting to 102 cards split among 11 teams. The Red Sox were one of those clubs, and that gave Topps one last shot at Fisk in a Boston uniform. It looks to me like they chose an old one. I'm no MLB TOG expert, but isn't that V-neck pullover the one that the Sox wore through 78 and not in 79 or 80? Whatever the case, it's still a great-looking card of a Boston legend. 1981 Topps traded Carlton Fisk, number 762. Technically, Topps already had their Fisk White Sox going by the end of the strike-torn 1981 season, thanks to their involvement with Drakes and Permographics, and to Opeachy to an extent. But their inaugural traded set was the first time Fisk appeared in a full-blown Topps design and his White Sox uniform together. In this one, Fisk stands with a bat on his socks-clad shoulder looking off to his left. Seems like he's about to yell at those damn kids to get off his lawn. Again. Like our video? Then like our videos and subscribe to our channel. WaxPackGods.com